it's a great, great to be here with you today uh, in this OCP conference. And my name is João. I work, I'm a network engineer. I work for Facebook in the data center networking team. And today I'll be talking to you about how do we scale large capacity needs inside our uh, Facebook regions. So I'll try to give a little bit of perspective on high level, how do we process traffic in the overall uh, infrastructure. And then I will be focusing on more specifically, how do we tackle large scale capacity needs inside our regions. First off, let me just introduce a little bit of nomenclature here. Um, so when people access uh, our platform, they are in fact accessing a very broad uh, infrastructure. And this infrastructure spans across uh, its worldwide infrastructure. Um, in the end of the day, when you are accessing your laptop, your phone, etc., you are basically triggering a lot of capacity, a lot of traffic inside our data centers. And of course, we have a lot of data centers spread across the world. Um, these data centers are basically grouped together, the ones that are geographically closed, in what we call a region. So a region is just basically a construct to encapsulate a lot of data centers. Um, of course, these data centers have to talk to each other inside the same region, and also from a different region. So to interconnect uh, all the buildings, and in every building we have a fabric, which is already uh, uh, exposed to the, to the community, um, we need to find a way to efficiently interconnect all these fabrics inside the same region. And the way we do this is basically add a new layer that basically aggregates all the fabric. And that layer is simply called fabric aggregation. So this, has two main, this layer has two main um, goals. So the first one is all the traffic that moves from one fabric to another inside the same region um, has to transverse this layer. So this is, represents the big majority of the traffic. We call this the east-west direction. And this corresponds to most of the traffic volume inside our region. But that's not just that, that, that direction. We also have uh, inverse direction, which is what we call north-south. And this type of traffic is all the traffic that leaves our data center fabrics in every single building in that specific region, all the way up to the backbone infrastructure, destined to uh, another region or end user. If we zoom in on this fabric aggregation layer, what do we see is just a collection of independent aggregation nodes. Um, different, different regions might have different uh, number of nodes. So if the region demands a lot of traffic in both directions, we just add more nodes. Uh, or if the region is small in terms of buildings, doesn't demand, demand a lot of capacity because probably has less fabrics, then we just compress the number of nodes to be efficient. Of course, these nodes have visibility. Every single node has visibility to all the fabrics. So they can steer traffic from one to another. At the same time, every single node has visibility or has connectivity to the backbone infrastructure. Um, this means that basically the fabric aggregation layer process every single packet that either enters and exits our data centers. So it's a very critical uh, tier in our network. And it suffers pressure from two different angles, two different pressure vectors. The one is, of course, uh, the demand per fabric. So every single fabric has its own specific demands. Uh, and that's the existing infrastructure that we already have. However, uh, the way we also scale the, the complete infrastructure is also adding more data centers in region. So as you can imagine, this every single aggregation node needs to have uh, visibility to all the fabrics and many more fabrics as we keep growing and as our experience in the platform keeps expanding and our user base keep, keeps expanding. So as we add more and more fabrics, every single aggregation node has to provide the radix or the port density that we need to interconnect all these fabrics. At the same time, we need flexibility because not all the regions are the same. So different regions demand different, uh, demand different uh, capacity needs. So, the solution for these aggregation nodes has to have these three main uh, drivers. So be able to provide a lot of capacity, huge demands of capacity, in fact, and provide a lot of flexibility so we can adapt this on per region basis. And at the same time, don't be efficient on how the way we operate these, these, these nodes. Um, and 
probably the fourth point is, of course, provide uh, good levels of resiliency. So if one node goes down, we don't, we don't isolate the region, or if a bunch of nodes go down, we don't degrade too much the capacity of the whole layer. So to address the scaling needs for these independent nodes, there are usually two, two methods to do this. The first method is rely on the industry or the ability to develop very uh, high chassis-based devices to provide more and more port dense per AG node. This turns out to be a little bit complicated, and Nether is going to give a second, second part of this talk. He's going to explain a little bit better uh, and in more detail how, what are the challenges around this, but in fact, we select a completely different strategy, and the strategy is basically disaggregating the small individual components that a chassis has, uh, which is in basically, we can think of line cars or optics and so on, but disaggregating allow us, disaggregating our node architecture into very simple building blocks allow us to scale very fast uh, to adapt new technology. We can just prototype a specific technology on these basic building blocks and ship them to production to test them and so on. Uh, at the same time, we are also building a distributed system that has very small failure domains. So if a specific uh, building block fails, we don't compromise the whole node. So this can operate very independently. Um, of course, this provides a lot of modularity as well, because if I, in some region we need a small node size, then we just deploy less building blocks. But if there is a large, a large region that demands a lot of capacity, then basically just add more building blocks. It's very, uh, this, the, the size of the node is very, can be very uh, from region to, re to region very easily. So how did we in fact do this? If we look at um, the node, we basically implement a two-layer cross-connect architecture. And these two layers, every, one of each, each one of these layers have specific uh, responsibilities. So the down, the red bubbles, is basically the downstream layer. And this downstream layer is basically responsible to steer traffic, the east-west traffic, and as well as the north-south north traffic. Uh, it's important to see that the downstream subswitches, the red circles in the picture, um, have full localization. That means that every single node has visibility to all the fabrics. So all the traffic, east-west traffic, stays contained inside this layer. This is an, an important characteristic. For all the traffic that has to go to another region or to a pop or the end user, the traffic is sent up to the upstream layer. And this upstream layer is just responsible to send the traffic to the backbone infrastructure. These two layers can, which I'm representing here with M and N, can have different sizes inside the nodes, and as well as different sizes between regions, nodes implemented in between different regions. So it's very, very scalable, but at the same time very flexible in terms of the capacity units that ship to the data center. Um, and inside this, this logical node, we basically use uh, our uh, BGP implementation from FBOS, and all the switches also run uh, FBOS. Once we, then, once we identify the initial setup for uh, these individual, individual log nodes, the sizing, how many switches do we use on the downstream layer, how many switches do we use on the upstream layer, then we can ship this to the data center ground, uh, to the data center floor, and just basically uh, replicate these, these units, these logical nodes, multiple times. How many times? It depends, again, on the region needs. Uh, if there is a, re a region that needs a lot of capacity, we just ship more and more uh, these nodes um, to interconnect more and more fabrics. Uh, usually we tend to have the same node size or node geometry uh, inside the same region, so it can become consistent. So I have here some examples of, if you vary M and N values, the sizing of these two layers, and if we add more and more uh, different numbers of nodes per region, it heals different units of capacity. It de really depends on your needs. Uh, if it happens to be that in your case, you, need a, you can accept a very high oversubscription ratios between these two layers, uh, you can probably look at these numbers of, for instance, 24 uh, downstream subswitches and eight upstream subswitches. And if we deploy 16, of, 16 nodes in region, it heals 
uh, 921.6 tera just for interconnecting fabrics in the region. Uh, this also, as I said before, uh, is, an, uh, is a strategy that allows us to have very small failure domains. So we can operate these nodes either at the subswitch level or at the complete node level. So if an individual subswitch fails, we can have, we have uh, our ability and our tooling to basically take individual wedge uh, or individual subswitches out of service for debugging purposes. And we, at the same time, we can accept multiple failures inside the same node spread across multiple nodes. So it's very flexible from the failure domain point of view. Um, at the same time, our tooling understands the con this concept of node and at the same time understands the concept of subswitch. So this hierarchy is brought up into our tooling so that the operator doesn't need to, or the tool that, uh, the automated tool that uh, is responsible to, for the mitigation of the failures of the node doesn't really need to know if it's accessing a subswitch or the complete node. This is completely abstracted from, from the tooling, uh, on the tooling side, uh, the way we operate this, this uh, either at the subswitch level or in the node level. Uh, and this is just a strategy for an architecture strategy to implement large scale nodes or units of capacity in the data center. It doesn't really need to be on the, on the aggregation tiers. It can be reusable pretty much everywhere on our infrastructure. And with that, I will end over to Nader. Just one comment, if you are a presenter and you leave the stage or you get on the stage, turn your microphone off um, and we'll avoid that feedback we got. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Nader and I'll talk about the hardware side of the fabric aggregator project here. So, let me look at my slides here. So, I'll start with the problem statement, and I'll give some context around that, then I'll uh, describe the approach and the philosophy we took to the design of this thing, it's a large radix switch, and I'll zoom into the cable assembly, which was actually the heart of this uh, project. So let's start from the basic. What is the unit of bandwidth? If you think about it, the unit of bandwidth in a data center network is what uh, we replicate to meet the overall demand of the tier. And this is very you know, applicable to every tier of the network when you think about it. So um, in our case, in the fabric aggregator, that's what Zhao mentioned as the ag node in terms of the getting the terminology. So what is a rack? A rack is a container that has space, cooling, and power limits. So if you notice, the unit of bandwidth is a, very, is a logical construct, and a rack is a very physical construct. So the problem arises when you want to map that unit of bandwidth into a rack. It's a logical thing and a physical thing. So what happens on the one end of the spectrum is that the unit of bandwidth, the ideal one, the optimal one, may not utilize the rack properly. And the other end of it is that it may actually not fit in one rack at all. So <clears throat> how do we build the ag node, the unit of bandwidth? So let's think about what we need. We needed flexibility. Like John mentioned, we needed very flexible east-west and north-south bandwidth ratios. We needed scalability. As the demand of the tier grows and we go to the next technology node, we would have to be able to scale this architecture, same kind of architecture up. And we need iterability. We want it to be quick turnaround. We didn't want to wait for a long time to build this thing. So where does rack fit in this picture? Definitely not as a design constraint. We didn't want the rack to be a limit. We wanted the rack at most to be a design parameter, something that we can optimize for. We say, well, if it fits in one rack, we save this and this and that, but it doesn't have to really. So our approach, how did we do it? So broad strokes, what we did is that we kind of agreed on the DC facing and the backbone facing um, bandwidth ratios. For example, uh, this, let's say this landed on 24 downstream units and eight upstream units. We were lucky this one fitted in one rack. It didn't have to, but it did in the first generation. Then what we said was that we decoupled the notion of backplane in an integrated chassis as a standalone component. And we ended up with two building blocks. One were the switches, the DU and UU switches that Joe showed, and one was the topology, 
which is the, uh, that, that, that the wires that interconnect the DU and UU layers together. And that's like historically done by the backplane. So you might call this a topology disaggregation. The disaggregator separated the topology of the switch from the switch itself. So this is a pictorial representation of the same thing. Uh, as an example, 24 down and eight up. So those are the, the bubbles are the wedge 100. So wedge 100 was a proven existing technology and we have, you know, we've deployed that uh, in our fleet. And the interconnection between them, that is what we call the cable assembly unit. So let's focus on the cable assembly unit. So the design goals. We prioritize serviceability, install, and maintenance over cost. And the reason for that is unlike monolithic chassis that comes with the backplane integrated, we actually had to connect the DU and UU switches to the backplane ports on the data center floor. So we wanted to minimize the human error, the probability of human error. So we wanted this to be really easy and uh, straightforward to, to, to assemble together. And the options that we had or we explored, we wanted to explore the optical for obvious reasons of multiple rack span. Uh, so we went down the both single mode optics and multi-mode optics on one dimension. And on the other dimension, we explored both traditional patch panel type, the manually furcated fabric uh, uh, path, as well as the robotically uh, routed fiber. And we also built one with DAC, with the fully electrical version. So let's focus on these different flavors a little bit. I'm gonna dwell on this one to basically point out some basic recurring themes in here. So that thing over there is our cable assembly unit. So it's a six RU in rack design over there. And if you, um, if you notice that top switch at the bottom, so that is a UU switch because it has 24, a lot of backplane facing ports. So you can tell that's a UU unit. And you can kind of tell that the connections between the ports of the switch and the ports of the backplane are very logical. It's very regular. So, you know, it's kind of, there's a pattern to that. We wanted to minimize the number of fiber matings on, on the backplane ports. So we came up with this notion of, the, we deployed the notion of ganged modules. So in this case, we actually had a cable with three-way breakouts. So those three breakouts connect to the switch ports and on the other, on, on the other end of that, there will be a single connection to the backplane, corresponding backplane port. So this is the engineering drawing of the cable assembly unit. So just to highlight, so that thing over there, the top one is a UU facing backplane port. Uh, so if you remember, we needed 24 connections and um, with a three-way cable breakout, we needed eight ports for the UU. And the bottom, sorry, the bottom one is the DU facing port. And again, three by three, we needed eight. So we, there's one unused link over there. That is a time check. We got about five minutes. Sure. Yeah. So this shows the, um, the actual fiber routing that happens inside the cable assembly unit. This is called the flex plane um, technology. And um, this is done, the fiber is robotically routed on a substrate over an adhesive layer. And the good thing about this is that the fiber pitch, the routing pitch is very fine. It's like order of 250 microns. So you can have a very large density kind of optical backplane, if you like, with this technology. The lead time is a little longer than the traditional one because this thing, this PCB-ish thing, has to be designed to order. But once it, it's designed once, the manufacturing and the production of that is guaranteed to be error-free. Unlike the manual patch panel where every unit that you ship has to be manually, there's a human interaction in every unit that you ship. So let's move on to quickly to CWDM4 version of this thing. It's a very similar thing. In this case, uh, we used a 12-way um, breakout cable for the UU and an 8-way for the DU. So we needed two ports for the UU and one port for the DU, basically. It's a simpler connection. And that's the engineering drawing for the example of the 12-way breakout for the UU facing cable. On the multi-mode, we experimented with the pigtail AOC and we changed up the design, the cable assembly from an in-rack unit to a side plane. As you can see, that thing is on the side of the rack, basically. And we had the two-way breakout in there. And this basically shows uh, the connection uh, of, the, of the switch port to the corresponding side plane port. And um, 
so it's a two-way breakout. We need a 24, so it's tw 12 UU uh, facing ports, and similarly, eight DU facing ports. The switches are the wedge 100, again, that's shown at the bottom, so the connection between them. So basically, the point I'm trying to make is a very, very kind of trivial to assemble together on the data center floor. We also built one with DAC. Uh, we retained the notion of the site plane. Uh, however, the thing was very expensive, so we had to break it into three modules and use aluminum and all that stuff to build it. But we learned that we cannot scale this kind of thing very far, but we built it anyway. Um, all right, side by side. On one end of the extreme is CWDM4 uh, based um, cable assembly unit. It's the highest cost, highest power. However, it has the best scalability to multi-rack and it is operationally very friendly. And on the other end of the spectrum, there was the DAC solution that was the cheapest, no power at all. However, it's not scalable and it's very difficult to operate. So we chose to operationalize the CWDM version four, uh, four ver uh, version first in our data center. So in summary, what did we do? We built a large radix switch and we did it with a proven switching technology, what we already had, and we, we know how it works and all that. We leverage a lot of design, a lot of um, software, FBOS, uh, as, uh, and uh, so we, we had that, and then we also introduced the notion of a cable assembly unit, which is kind of like a disaggregated backplane, and in doing so, we validated the manufacturability of this thing. We explored the space of what's, uh, what's possible to build with what technology and so forth, what's the limit of the, of the density of this cable assembly unit. And we gained really good experience with the operationalization of this thing. I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. They've left just enough time for one or two questions. You can use the mic over here or raise your hand. I'll bring you a mic. Let's start it off here. Hello. Yeah, go Hi. Ahead. Hey. Um, I've seen the, the diagram on the cabling. Uh, what part of this work have you automated uh, when deploying such a large scale uh, infrastructure? Uh, or do you automate also the documentation and the cabling documentation you have to provide to the contractors or the people actually doing the job? Yeah, I'll take that. We, uh, we released this packet to the OCP for this. And yes, we, for example, for the cable assembly unit, we actually came up like examples I was showing, engineering drawings and specification, and, and that's what we submitted to the manufacturer. So for the CWM4, it was a classical TRM based manufacturer, and for the other one, the FlexPlane, it was a robotically one. Um, if I get the question right, so that's, yeah, we, we came up with this spec ourselves. Okay, I have uh, two questions, one for each of you. Uh, Zhao, um, the question I have, I mean, the case for doing the disaggregated models in network engineering, I think the case is, is pretty clear from a cost point of view. Uh, the question I have is around congestion. And one of the areas that the, the traditional integrated chassis do very well is dealing with congestion and head of line blocking. So my, my question for you is, is how have you measured and, and analyzed the ability of the ag nodes to deal with congestion? And then my question for you is what's with the colorful light? <laughs> they're really they're really pretty, but I just am curious what they're for. All right, I can probably go first. Congestion. Um, it really depends on your use case, right? If we in the downstream layer, it's where we process most of the volumes of the traffic. We have a one-to-one -one oversubscription between fabrics, right? And we know that the oversubscription between these two layers is acceptable, and we can expand them independently. So congestion, I'm guessing you are, you are talking about long-term congestion, not microbursts or something like that. Uh, for the long-term congestion or the capacity needs, we just basically, that's the, one of the great flexibility, one of the great properties of this type of solutions is that you can, in, you can vary this, the, layer, the sizing of these two layers independently. So if you see that there is a lot of north-south traffic demand, we just add more upstream subswitches, right? At the same time, if we want to provide seamless amount of uh, capacity, we just replicate one more node, and we keep adding more and more nodes to add the same proportion of, of, uh, of capacity. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, I'll just instead of answering the light question, which is I don't know, <laughs> I just add one uh, note. In this case, we actually wanted a blocking switch because of that demand of the tier. So when you, you know, the fabric speed up for line card fabric card architecture is based on non-blocking switch. We actually wanted a blocking switch in this case. The notion of oversubscription comes in there. <laughs> 